thank you for coming here and you know coming here to listen to me talk about Selenium, which makes me really glad that this is a one-track conference because if, uh, if there are other tracks, you'd probably be finding something else to go listen about right now. Um, let me start with a little bit of a story. It's, it's probably going to be a little bit odd to hear it coming from me, um, but the story really is um, that I hate browser testing, um, the end. Uh, that's, I've I even built a website about it. It's called Magium. It's uh, basically a browser testing framework that I use because I was involved in some kind of a project that needed to have some kind of testing automation built into the browser. And I'm a back-end developer. <laughs> I don't do front-end. And so uh, at least, actually, no, I do front-end, but you don't want me to do front-end. I'm really bad at it. And so I built out a testing framework that allowed me to uh, kind of approach things in the way that I thought was going to be a little bit easier for, uh, for us to do. Now, we're not going to be talking about this today. We're going to be talking about a couple of the, the basic things that I found out while building this out and also dealing with some of the other pain. But um, um, so you're going to learn some of the things that I learned, though I'm not going to be specifically talking a lot about Magium itself. So like I said, I'm more of a back-end developer. I don't have credentials, but I do have a PhD in pain in trying to build out Selenium tests. And so um, my, my entire goal in building out this project was to try and keep other people from having to experience that same kind of pain. So a couple of uh, months ago, probably about six months ago, I put out a question on Twitter. I asked, a couple, I asked you, if, um, you know, how would you automate your browser testing? And these are basically the results that came back. Um, the first question is, how well does your organization conduct automated browser testing? And 75% said we hit our code, or we edit our code and we hit refresh which I actually do most of the time, too. Um, a couple of them said not, not that great, and then others, the people who were actually satisfied with their browser testing, which I'm pretty sure half of them are lying. Um, let me see you there. Um, but then there's the follow-up question. Would you automate your browser-based testing automation if you could? And then, yes, absolutely, everywhere I could was about 65%. Uh, in some places where it's not too hard to, uh, to do, is another 20%, and only about 15% or so said that, uh, uh, you know, that they wouldn't really want to do it. Now, granted, the sample size is really small, but it did, it's a sample size, and so it's science, so this is a legitimate result. And why would you want to automate your browser testing? Why? Because this is who your QA testers are. There's, there's a, a joke that I heard one time, and I don't know if you're going to find it funny, but I find it hilarious. Uh, there's a woman who comes onto a bus, and the bus driver uh, looks at her and he says, that is an ugly baby. And she's like, gets mad, really, really mad. And she walks to the back of the bus, and she sits down, she's in a huff, and there's a guy who sits, who's sitting there, and she goes, he goes, well, you're, did, he said something mean, didn't he? She's like, oh my goodness, it's so mean, I just want to go over there, I want to beat him. And he goes, okay, well, fine, how about you, you, you can do why don't you go up there, you know, speak your piece to them, and, but while you're doing it here, I'll hold your monkey. And, <laughs> yeah, it's just, I love equivocation. It's the, uh, the joke about, you know, these two, uh, oh, what is it, the, these two cannibals who are eating, eating a clown and ask, does this taste funny to you? Um, but, no, <laughs> no, it's bad. But anyway, that's kind of what, you know, a key, when you're talking about your QA testers, I mean, they're really coming in, they're telling you that your baby is ugly. And what, you know, testing automation allows you to do is allow you to bypass some of that. Now, in reality, obviously, testing automation allows you to do a lot more than that. Um, there is an initial uh, investment that is required in order to actually get these tests going. But as you move on and you have a system that's actually in place, you see a decreased amount of time that's going to be spent on actual test automation. And not only that, what you're also going to be seeing is that you're going to be catching things that you didn't think of. Who, like, who would think, hey, I have to click on this button on this configurable product or on this simple product or on this category. I do this all the time. I don't have to test this. And it just takes care of some of those really simple things so you can focus on actually doing actual QA as opposed to having to um, you know, go on and do this entire QA process all the time. So there's a couple of things you know about Selenium and Selenium testing already. Um, and they're all, probably all true. Browser testing is hard, and it is. Browser testing is brittle, and it is. And browser testing is often not worth it, and I would agree with that. Um, if, you have, if you're not committed to it, and you don't have the amount of time that's necessary to actually build out a structure for your testing, kind of like what Matthew was talking about, having this whole uh, culture of uh, continuous improvement in your organization, 
it will be very difficult to make uh, to build out this kind of testing automa automation in a way that is going to be beneficial for you. So, like I said, this is going to be just a basic uh, view on what are some of the things that you need in order to get uh, Selenium testing. Oops, I don't want to take a picture of everybody, to get uh, Selenium testing uh, working properly. First of all, um, who here has heard of the Selenium IDE? If you can just raise your hands, this is a little Firefox tool. Um, basically, don't use it. Um, it's, it's, I want to say it's good, but I can't bring myself to say it. Uh, it gets you to a point where you can actually go through and just click on the browser and get things kind of working and get some level of automation. It's a good introduction, but it's not actually going to get you very far. As soon as something changes and you have more than one browser test, it's going to be just an absolute pain in the butt to go back and make all the changes to all your individual browser tests in order to make it actually work. Um, and so what I'd actually say is start right at the bare bones is minimal. There's a lot of good frameworks out there um, that help you when doing some kind of testing automation. Don't start there. Um, because there's some underlying stuff that you need to know before actually getting uh, to that point. Um, I'd also say, too, first stay away from any kind of a GUI-based Selenium testing uh, framework out there. They have the same problem that uh, the Selenium IDE has in that they tend to be brittle. They tend to work on very simple scenarios, but anybody who's tried to script the one-page checkout knows there's no such thing as a simple scenario when you're trying to go through a full end-to-end -end test in a Magento. They also tend to not handle uh, asynchronous processes as well. You click a button, sends off an AJAX call, and then you get a pop-up. These tend to be fairly, uh, it's, it's fairly difficult to predict what's actually happening. And so these kinds of um, kind of lower end, um, lower end user, I guess you could kind of say, um, they don't handle that kind of uncertainty as well. Um, and also, and this is actually a big one, because it, when you're trying to build out uh, more complex tests, you want to be able to reuse as much as possible. Oftentimes, grouping functionality in a useful fashion is very difficult to do. And also, when you're getting out, when you're starting out, understand that you are going to have technical debt that you're going to have to go back and fix at some point. Um, getting started will take some trial and error as you get used to it. So when you're getting set up, um, there's only a couple of things that you need. You don't need to have a lot of the, ex uh, the extent of to extensive tooling out there. Just simply start simple. Um, go to the Selenium HQ website and download the Selenium server. It's a basically a Java application. Um, it will run directly in your console, and you can connect to it using a REST API, which you're not actually going to have to need to know. You're not going need to need to know that, as you'll see here in a bit. I would also recommend using the Chrome driver download. It's a binary that integrates with uh, Selenium server. If you want to take a look, if my Alt-Tab works, and it's not. Come on, Alt-Tab. It's, uh, this is really small, isn't it? Uh, but there is just a, it's really easy to do, it's called Java, you pr provide your Chrome driver setting via a, a Java directive, and uh, it will start up and it will uh, handle Chrome uh, calls as well. And I like using Chrome driver as opposed to the default Firefox because I just like the, the browser tools better in uh, Chrome than I do in Firefox. Um, also to PHP unit, you don't need PHP unit to connect to, um, to Selenium server. Obviously Selenium server is not PHP, so you don't really need PHP unit. But what PHP unit allows you to do is allows you to make use of assertions and it allows you to make use of your existing unit testing functionality in there so that you do have uh, something that you're actually working with that you're familiar with. And then the second of all, um, at a minimum, you can use the Facebook web driver. Um, I've tried three different Selenium uh, interfaces with PHP unit, and web driver is the only one that I find actually works well. There is one that you can get for PHP unit. It's the PHP unit Selenium 2 something or other, um, and it works, but I found that it's a little bit on the slow side, and so I found that the Facebook web driver uh, approach is the one that works the best. So getting into your individual tests, there are just a couple of things we need to, we need to think about. You have uh, two kind of faces of uh, testing. And the first thing is a selector. A selector helps you select elements that you want to do something with on the page. Um, WebDriver will, will use an ID-based one, XPath, CSS selectors and things. These are things that you want to get, like I want to get a menu element that I want to either click or I want to mouse over so it's going to trigger another element. Um, or it could be an add to cart button. The first thing you need to do is you need to actually get the element that you're going to be working with, and that's done generally through selectors. 
Um, you can use whichever selector you like, but I've found that it's easier to standardize. And I've also found that it's easier to standardize on XPath. There are, I, I like using CSS selectors because they're nice and easy. They work with CSS classes really well. But there are a lot of limitations when you're trying to traverse the DOM tree of an HTML document that's being rewritten in particular. So they're good, but they don't cover all the scenarios that you're going to be working with. And XPath basically allows you to um, go back and forth and navigate the DOM tree as necessary. And I'll, I'll show you why in an example in a little bit. So XPath itself is not your enemy. It's actually very powerful. There is loads that you can do with it. And it, it took me probably a solid month or so before I really started actually enjoying it. And I, I started enjoying it when it was helping me pass my test. So um, using, uh, using XPath for that is uh, quite useful. There's a couple of different, sorry, there's a couple of different functions that XPath has. We'll be taking a look at that in a little bit. Um, but um, XPath is just not simply traversing a DOM tree. You can actually modify uh, selectors or modify the data in selectors in order to uh, turn them into the kind of data that you actually need. And again, we'll see what that looks like in just a little bit. Now, the second one or the second component of this is actions. Actions are things that take place on an element that has been returned by a selector. It's usually going to be re uh, returned by an element. It's going to be a web driver element, which is an interface that has a couple of different um, methods on it which allow you to interact with that element. Uh, some examples are click, clear, send keys. There used to be one called text, which would just basically send text to an element, but now you actually have more direct control with it with some of the newer APIs. Um, so you'll need to call, specifically call clear on an element, uh, like, which is like an input text element, um, and then call set keys on there, and that will send any text you want to an element, so obviously used for putting in names, passwords, whatever it is. And if you want to click, there's a click method. If there's, uh, you can get the location of the element on the page. If you want to get a place where you want to move your, brow your, your uh, mouse over to, there's a lot of stuff that you can really do with those, uh, those actions in there. So um, and you, you, it, it shows up via code completion, so we're not going to go through the whole list of them here. Um, additionally, there are different types of abstractions that WebDriver has as well. You have a mouse um, abstraction meaning that you can directly interact with the mouse itself. So if you want to move the mouse you know, a pixel at a time, you're able to do that. If you want to click and drag, you can dr do that by working directly with the mouse object itself. There's a, there's a keyboard object. I found that you don't really need to do that, uh, but you do have those available for you. You can also send in control characters. So uh, there is one where I need, needed to uh, use the delete key, and you can, you can send in control characters for delete keys. There's a lot of stuff that you can do simply by passing in text, and there's constants that are available in certain, uh, in, in certain Facebook web driver uh, classes that allow you to do that. Um, there's one function that I do want to highlight. It's actually a, a method that is um, directly in the web driver uh, uh, adapter itself, and it's the wait function. And what it does is it allows you to define specific and wait until certain uh, conditions um, actually exist before continuing on. What it basically does, it has a callback that checks to make sure that a condition returns either true or false. Once it returns a true, then it continues on. So to see what this looks like, again, I have to get out of here and go into my IDE. Um, we have a couple of examples here. Um, the first one is we want to see one of the things that we need to take, uh, take into account when we're looking at navigating a DOM tree, this is just a very simple um, HTML page. It says this is some content up here. Now, this is one of the parts where uh, XPath kind of hurts you a little bit because we have an XPath here, and we look at our text. We'll inspect it. I hope you guys can see. It's a little bit small even on my screen. Um, we have this value here. This is this is some content. We're going to select it by the main selector. Now, the reason why I have this in here is because oftentimes you're going to have multiple individual CSS classes on individual um, elements. And sometimes it's for styling. You want to get multiple styles onto an individual element. And so that's basically what we have here is it's going to be a container, so it's a bootstrap. Um, well, it would be if I actually had the bootstrap CSS in. Then we have another class called main content. So what we're trying to do here is we're going to get a div with the class main content. And I'll take away my trusty little thing there. And we'll run. And it failed. Why? Because XPath is pretty finicky. It's very exacting 
in what it actually needs. So what I did instead to show a, a, a scenario how it would succeed is I built out a little bit of functionality here that contains this long little bit of string in here. Um, just wait, this one's not that bad. We'll see a, bit, a bad one coming up in a bit. What this one does is it normalizes the space on the class attribute. It concatenates it with spaces on either side, and then it puts the, the text directly in there. So it's not really all that complicated. It's just kind of verbose. But when you're dealing with class-based selection, and we're going to see how this kind of plays into things in a, in a little bit later on, um, this kind of class-based selection, I'm going to put a breakpoint in there, and we will debug it. And do a bunch of things. We're building our XPath now. And this is one of the things that you can do when you're building out your own functionality is don't be afraid of building helper classes because it will help you reduce and reuse a lot of the, the functionality that you're using. So this ends up building out a div, contains, concat, normalized space with a main content class on there. And now when we run this test, the right one, our test is now passed. So there's some things that you need to know about that, but generally speaking, a lot of this stuff is actually fairly simple um, once you find a couple of the different patterns uh, that we have in there. So let's go back to playing. And so we have wait. So we, we are at, oh, good, good time. This is probably the more important part of this. Like I said, there's a lot of stuff that you, that you need to get to know just simply by practicing. But that said, there's also a lot of things that you can do when you're actually building out your extensions and building out your website itself uh, that can really make this a lot easier. So this is uh, probably one of the more important slides uh, of the talk for that. First one is that when you're building out the tests, structure your HTML in a way that makes for writing easy selectors. What that means is that you have functionality. If you have specific function on the page that needs to be test, tested, assign an HTML ID to it. Obviously, you, know, you have to use some level of judgment calls on there. But if you have a save button, give it an ID of save. It's so much easier to work with HTML IDs than it is to build a complex CSS um, uh, queries that you need to get you the element that you're looking for. Then also, and this is another important one too, use CSS class names on elements that have meaning. Now, I have an example of that here. I'm not, oops, I'm not going to uh, run through the test, just so, but I want you to be able to see what I mean by that. I have a structure uh, HTML here, and you see that I have a click me button. So obviously, it's very easy to figure out what the ID is. But then I also have meaning here. I have a list of all the different Twitter accounts I have, KP Trade, which is my personal one, Magium Lib, Squawk It, which is a little thing that I'm working on. But I gave my table an ID so I can specify which one it is, and then I gave each one a you know, Twitter screen name. Because these elements have meaning, I can then write queries and very easily access uh, those elements. And the event, of the, uh, the way this ends up looking is uh, this one right here, for example. I'm building a test here that says I have three Twitter accounts. And as a website customer, I want to see all of Kevin's public Twitter accounts. And so I can very simply build out that XPath. I have an assert count that's going to be three. And I run it. And the test passed. And, I d and it works out well because I gave uh, cells that had uh, meaning, I gave them a specific uh, um, ID. And again, if we look at an example of how easy it is to uh, uh, work with IDs as opposed to um, individual uh, XPath queries, in this case, this is one where it's going to load up the file. And then when it clicks on um, the Click Me button, it also is going to show an element. So the first thing it does is we get the individual element, which is called hidden element, again, using an ID because it's, it's got a specific function. We assert false that is displayed, again, using a combination of the uh, PHP unit and the um, WebDriver functionality. Click on Click Me, and then simply assert true that it's actually working at that point. We'll see if it actually works. Get this stuff And so fast, and yeah, it passed. So just those simple things, oops, wrong one, um, using IDs for pieces that have function, and then being able to um, assign 
classes to elements that have meaning makes it a lot easier for me as a tester to come in and um, select the individual elements that I want. Um, another thing too, uh, don't delay function response. If there's something that's going to happen on the page, make it something happen immediately. You don't have to have the function triggered immediately, but have something happen so that you know that something is going on. And I give an example here of the Magento 2 checkout login functionality because you put in the email address and then a second or later you may or may not get a box that comes up that says password uh, that allows you to put in, your, in the individual password for it. Um, that was actually a lot harder to script than I was actually expecting. And a lot of it was because that, that functionality was not necessarily predictable. Now, Magento 2 is actually a lot easier to, to do testing than Magento 1, but that's just an example of where it actually ended up being a little bit harder. Um, again, make things predictable. And also, and this is an important one because there, this um, actually did make things difficult for me a number of times, is do not orphan text. Now, what I mean by that is, in here, I have a value here that says, um, it's called orphan text, so you know what I'm talking about. And it basically puts in a random number. And I want to select the element, and you see I don't have anything on, on the P tag. Um, I do have an ID for the random tag, but I'm going to look at my structure test here that has this. This is not going to work. I'm trying to get a P with a text of the number text. And that's not actually going to work because there's actually a child node underneath it. Now, what actually would make this easier is if I were to simply make it a span, because the spans are somewhat, uh, they don't really hurt you all that much, and then wrap it in a span. And then when I do that, that makes my text much more selectable. And so this kind of orphan, uh, keeping away from orphan text um, helps to uh, uh, protect against that, allows you to be more specific, which is something that XPath likes. And so these are a couple of things, again, adding HTML IDs to things that have function, adding CSS class names on things that have meaning, um, make something happen immediately that you can, tr that you can uh, watch for, make results predictable, do not orphan text, those are, these are some basic things that you have. And here's an example in the Magento 1 uh, checkout process that if, say, you wanted to get the text for the grand total value, um, you need to start it out with uh, the XPath, where's my mouse, I oh, don't have one. Look for the table ID with a checkout. One of the table checkout descendants, which is a TD, is going to contain the words grand total. After you've found the one that has the grand total, you have to find the following sibling, that's a, a TD element as well, find a descendant in there that's actually a span that contains the class name price. And what would be really nice would be to have something like ID, ID equals grand total price or, or something like that. That way you don't have to have these kind of very long verbose um, XPath selectors in there because when you're doing stuff like this, this is really <laughs> what your life is really like. So um, this is what it's like writing tests in an unstructured website. And I know because I've done it a number of times. I had to do IT crowd, I'm sorry. Um, so when you're structuring your tests, we talked about structuring your website, now we're going to talk about structuring the tests. Um, try to keep everything in distinct locations. What that means is that if you have uh, functionality for doing menu navigation, put that in one place. If you have functionality for cart, doing carts, put that in one place. Um, there is a design pattern out there called the page object pattern, which a lot of people use and is really good. Um, but when you're looking for a page that's as complex as what Magento pages tend to be, it can actually become a little bit of an, uh, a burden. So what I do when I'm building out the tests is I call it Kevin's pattern. I'm sure somebody else has named it something cooler than that. But rather than working on the page basis, I work on the function basis. What am I trying to do? Now, the reason why I do that is because that actually ends up uh, matching very well with user stories as well. Because they'll say, like, as a front end user, I will want to go to the men's shirts category and click on the whatever shirt and click add to cart. And using that kind of a breakdown of your, te of your uh, test functionality matches what your users are actually doing. And so that makes uh, for much more clear demarcation of how uh, this is uh, done. Uh, we're running uh, a little bit out of time, um, but just some things. One of the things I like about using um, PHP unit is it's very easy to do debugging in there. So what I'll typically do is I'll take something like, um, I'll just do this one. This is a an example that I would have done if I had an hour <laughs> or three. And 
I'll just basically kick off the test. And then as I'm going through this, you know, you can go through it and just simply debug. And you can look at this. And you can take, oh, this button tube, will it actually work? Well, I'm going to go over here. I'm going to open up the that. I'm going to paste in, which is, of course, small. And I did something wrong. Oh, because I did the wrong, uh, the wrong selector. Oh, did the wrong browser. X, there we go. Now I can see that my button's in there. So I can go back and forth, and I can actually build my test out on the fly by just simply using the standard PHP X debug. So that makes, ends up making things a lot, a lot easier. So that was a very, very quick introduction. I hope it was useful. Uh, where to go next? Download the Selenium server. There is, you, there you, can, al you can always do the, uh, create the individual Chrome instance or the individual Firefox instance, but I found that it's a lot easier to simply use uh, the Selenium server, use the remote web connection uh, so that you can pass in which browser you're going to use via configuration. Um, so install Selenium server with Chrome driver, create a project, use Composer, require Facebook web driver, or if you want to use Magium, which is what I've been using in these tests because it does a lot of bootstrapping for you, uh, require Magium, Magium, or if you want to do some really cool stuff and actually use some of the stuff I spent seven months building out, um, require Magium Magento, and you can actually build out a checkout in about two minutes. It'll go from the front page to a category, to a product, to add to cart, and then do a full guest checkout. You can write that in about two minutes. Um, start simple. Uh, you know, start with a you know, simple category and product nav, add to cart, do some basic sanity checks first, maybe bug fixes, and just kind of build it into your process as you go along. As you get better at it, you're going to find there's a lot more that you can do for that. So we'll ask for some questions if you have, uh, if you want to take a look, my Twitter account's there. I'm going to actually have to book out of here pretty quickly because I have some commitments tomorrow that I need to meet, mate. Um, but if you want to uh, talk more about this, uh, feel free to email me, kschrader at magiumlib. My blog's at eschrade, um, magiumlib.com. And if you want the access to the source code, which should run without any problems from PHP in it, um, you can get it here on that GitHub link uh, 